What's up, everybody? Good to see you guys. So glad that you're with us as we kick off a new series today, Don't Let This Flop. And the whole idea behind this series is that you've come too far to let this fail. You, you've come to you put in too much work. You've invested too much into the things that matter most to see it fail. For example, in your marriage, you've invested too much, too much time, too much effort to let it fail. With your family, you, you put in too much. You, you put in too much time. You've invested everything that matters into your family. We're not going to let your family flop. With your finances, you don't want to see your finances fail. With your kids, come on, you've invested too much in your kids to see your kids not succeed. With your church, we're not going to let our church flop. With your walk with Jesus, we're not going to let that flop. We don't want to see that fail. And today I want to talk about maybe the most important thing. In fact, the Bible ranks this as the most important thing in life. We're going to be talking about how to make sure that our relationships don't fail. That's right. The Bible ranks relationships as the most important thing that we will ever experience in this life. And in fact, a teacher, an expert of the Jewish law asked Jesus this question. He said this in Matthew 22, he said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. And then watch, he said, this is the greatest and the foremost commandment, but the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So what they're saying is a healthy relationship, a vertical relationship with God is first and foremost. Secondly, a healthy horizontal relationship with others is a close second. So again, in this series, starting today, we're, we're going to talk about things that we want to see succeed. And I'm going to really drill down on this idea that we want to make sure our relationships don't flop. I don't know about you, but we all have relationship goals, don't we? <clears throat> really? Maybe you don't. I don't know. I know Pastor Lynn and I, we have relationship goals, hashtag relationship goals. You see it all over social media. And what that is, is that's people aspiring to see their relationship succeed based off what they see in another couple's relationship. So I thought it would be fun for me to go on social media and look up a few hashtag goals. I think we've got them. Take a look at this. Here's one. And I think I found this on Twitter. This is so nice. Watch. I just witnessed a very elderly man walk his elderly wife out to their car. He held the door open, helped her, got in the car. Then he revved the engine in his Ford Mustang. I could see them giggling. It was probably the cutest thing ever. That's relationship goals. <clears throat> now, I thought this was interesting. I love this. Take, take a look at this. A wife steals the cop car with her husband cuffed inside. <laughs> Let me tell you, that's legit. I'm, I mean, they're all in. I, I love that. When I saw it, not that I love the fact that he was arrested. Don't get me wrong. But the fact that his wife would be so all in, you know, like, you're not getting my husband. <laughs> Hashtag relationship goal. Now, this one, I got to tell you, this one bothered me on so many levels. Take a look at this. I just want to be able to hang out naked without the sex part. All right. All right, listen. First of all, if you're not married, what are you doing hanging out naked? Number one. Secondly, more importantly, if you are married and you're naked, you better be having sex. I'm just telling you, can, can we just talk for a minute on this subject? Because this is the weirdest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Pastor Lynn and I have been married 30 years. Not once have we ever said, I call her, oh honey, I'll be home in a few minutes. Why don't you get naked and we'll play cards? What? <laughs> Are you kidding? Let's, oh, let's get, let, let's get naked. Here's our plan tonight. It's Friday night. We're going to get naked and we're going to cook together. No, we get naked, baby. We're going for it. You know what I'm saying? That's what you do when you're married. Come on, somebody. Married people, help me. You don't just hang out. That's not a relationship goal. My gosh. Anyhow. 
relationship goals. No, no one said, I've got a great idea. I want to see my marriage get messed up, jacked up, be abusive and dysfunctional. That's a relationship goal. But sadly, for many of us, that's where it ends up. No one said, hey, I want to get married and then I want to spend all of our spare time arguing about money in our, in our relationship. People don't do that, but it happens. No one sets that out to be the goal, but it happens all the time. No one says, hey, here's what I want to do. I'm going to get in a relationship, then I'm going to get addicted to porn so that we can lose all intimacy in our relationship because what I'm seeing on my phone can never be matched in real life. No one sets out and says, that's my goal, but it happens all the time. No one goes, hey, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to start lying in my relationship. I'm going to start with just small lies, but then I'm going to graduate to medium lies, and hopefully someday I'll just be a great liar, and my, my spouse, my, my partner will never really be able to believe anything that I'm saying. That's a great relationship goal, or this even. No one says, Here, here's the plan long term. Uh, I want to get connected to everything other than my spouse. I want to invest all my time in my kids and I want to invest all my time in, in their sports. I'm, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that or I'm going to invest all my time in my career. I just want to focus on, on the career and I want to focus on, on my friends so that in 25 years when our kids are gone, we won't really even know each other because we invested in the wrong thing. Relationship goals. No one really does that, but sadly, it happens to so many of us. So today, I want to talk about how to get some handles on handling our relationships so that we can have biblical, solid, healthy relationships. Amen? And like, no matter who you are, what stage, what age, I think there's something for you in this today. I'm going to recommend you take notes today so that you can refer back to some of this stuff. And I, I wanna start with this thought today. You need to know or be reminded that there is an enemy and the enemy is against anything that God is for. There is an enemy in his army of minions, his army of demons, and anything that God loves, he hates. Anything that God wants to see move forward, the enemy is against and he wants to destroy. And the thing that God is for is healthy relationships. So you better believe that there is an enemy that wants to see your relationships fail. So take a look at this, Ephesians 6, 11. Here's what it says. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. And you just need to know this today. If you're going after God, the enemy is coming after you. Make no mistake about it. People go, no, 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 he's going after unbelievers. No, he's not. He's not wasting one moment on unbelievers. He's going after you so that he can destroy your testimony so that the things that you do in your life will have no real weight, carry no real value when unbelievers look at you and they'll say, well, if that's Christianity, I don't want it. No, no, no. The enemy is coming for you. And here's what the enemy always does. Watch. The enemy will always attack you in the area that you're most vulnerable every time. The enemy will attack you where you are the weakest. What he will do, watch, he will study your tendencies. He will see who you are, what you do, how you do it, and anywhere there is a weakness, that's where the enemy's coming. He will study you and that's where he's coming. So watch, Paul said this, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty power in this dark world. So remember this, and this is important based off of the scripture that we just read. When you're frustrated in your relationship, when you're angry, when you're fighting, when things aren't good, don't miss this. Your spouse is not your enemy, the enemy is the enemy. Don't miss that. Sometimes we get caught up fighting the wrong thing. And based off of what we just read, we're not fighting our spouse. We're fighting the enemy. And the enemy doesn't show up like we think. Like the enemy doesn't come with a red suit and a pitchfork. He comes disguised as everything you've always wanted. 
That's what he does. That's, that's who he is. So we have to be really, really careful about that. Now, think about this. Let's just say right now, like your phone went off and you, you got a, like a text and it was one of those like Amber Alerts. And what it said was, hey, warning, so-and-so just broke out of prison and you recognize the name. And what this means is when you saw this name, you realized the reason they got out is they're coming for you. That something happened along the line and they were against you and they were coming for you. And they're going to break in your home. They're going to try to destroy everything that you have. They're coming for your kids. They're, they're, they're loose and they're coming for you. Let me, let me ask you a question. What would you do? Well, some of you who are all about peace and love, you'd go get a gun. <laughs> you just do it. Why? Because there's too much at stake. You, you would say, I'm going to do whatever I need to do. I'm putting in a security system. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to protect the thing that is most valuable to me. You'd go, listen, some of you would get rid of the little snickerdoodle dog or whatever they're called. You'd go get a dog that bites. I don't, is that a dog, snickerdoodle? No, that's a food, isn't it? It's food. Whatever, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, sure, whatever. Anyhow, my dog crossed the Rainbow Bridge a while back. I said, bye, bye, bye. I'm, no more dogs for me. I, this has nothing, oh, please don't ooh and ah, please, please. I, I loved my dog, but like, listen, I don't have to clean up poop in the middle of the night anymore. God bless you all if you want to do it. That has nothing to do with my message, but anyhow. What was I talking about? Rainbow Bridge. See, that's, that's how I am. And one thing, I'm gone. Hang on a second, I'll get it. Your spouse is not your enemy, I already said that. Oh, you, you have the phone. So you get, you, get the, you get the alert on your phone. You're gonna protect, you're gonna protect your house. You're gonna do whatever you have to do to make sure that this person doesn't come for you and get what they're coming for, right? You're going to do whatever you have to do. Now watch. Here's what it says in 1 Peter 5.8. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Man, he's coming. You better stay alert. You just got an amber alert on your phone from Pastor Tim, because the enemy's coming. And we need to be on guard at all times. And let me bring it into context. Let me, let me say it like this. The enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for marriages and relationships to devour. That's what he wants to do. So the thing that we know about the enemy, it would be great if he did it, but he doesn't. He never announces his arrival, does he? He never goes, hey, get ready, get, get on guard, because here I come. Man, you, you better be ready. He doesn't do that. He just shows up when you least expect it. And he knows the area that you're vulnerable and he will always attack you in that area. It's not like on your car where there's a dashboard light that comes on that goes, warning, low tire pressure. Warning, you better change your oil. There's no like warning, here comes the enemy. You just need to know his tendencies and what he's going to do. And he'll always come at you where you're vulnerable. And here's two areas, if you're taking notes, this is two places that the enemy always comes at you and what he does, and here's, here it is if you're taking notes. The devil attacks, number one, with distractions, and number two, with seductions. Every time. Distractions and seductions. Let's start with distractions. It goes clear back to the Garden of Eden when the devil distracted Eve with food, with an apple. It's funny, 2,000 years later, it hasn't changed with women, has it? Just food, just bad food. I love it. Some things don't change, but it's true. L let me ask you a question. What are the things that distract you? Because we all have distractions. What are the things that are distracting you? And, and here's why it's important. Small distractions lead to great destructions. It might seem like a small thing at first. It might not seem like that big of a deal. But eventually, left unchecked, get ready. It will take you to places you never wanted to go, have you doing things that you never wanted to do. Let me give you an example. 
What's a distraction? Well, let me tell you what a distraction for me is. My phone. Seriously, my wife and I just talked about it yesterday. It's a distraction. Social media, small distraction. Here's a distraction. You're at work, and there's just somebody there. They just get you. They understand you. And it's easy for you to talk to them about what's going on with your marriage. Let me tell you, that's a distraction. Arguing over your finances. Just money it can be a distraction. Your kids can be a distraction. Did you know that? You go, kids, man, they're a gift from God. They absolutely are a gift from God. But listen, they keep us from focusing on the primary relationship. Distraction. All of these things. Well, my husband doesn't wine and dine me like some men do. Man, there, there are some men that are so romantic and my husband's not like that. And you know what you're doing? You're comparing what you have to what somebody else has and you're comparing their highlight reel to your behind the scenes and it's a distraction. All of these things, they might not seem like a big deal, but what I'm telling you, they are. How about this? I don't like the way you chew anymore. Oh, it just got real, didn't it? I don't like the way you chew. You, the, your, your constant tapping is bothering me. You know what my family told me the other day? I'm not kidding. Dad, you sing too much. They told me that. I sing too much. I, now, if they would have said, Dad, you scream too much, I could see that being a problem. I sing too much. Now, maybe it's the fact that I can't sing. I get it. My family, this is weird thing. We do, we, we tend to sing things that we shouldn't sing. Now I'm just thinking about that, we do. Linda does it, I do it, Kate and does it. We sing, like we'll go, it's so weird, I can't believe I'm sharing this with you. That's family, I guess, but. Where is the peanut butter and I need a knife? <laughs> things like that. Is that weird? It's a little strange. We do. Well, just sing things that you should say. Like, most normal people go, hey, where's the peanut butter? I need a knife. No, not Sidler's. Where is the peanut butter? I need a knife. And then we scat. I just scat, too. Anybody know what scatting is? Like, I'll just scat for no reason. I, don't, I have no idea, but it feels good. I'm not screaming. I'm singing. Make a joyful noise. So, small distractions lead to great destructions. What's distracting you gets us off track. And here's the second thing. Watch. The devil uses seductions. Seductions. Watch. Check this out. Ephesians 5.3. And this is as important today as it's ever been. And here's what Paul said. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity. What, what's he saying? Watch. We don't want to even open the door a crack to give the enemy an opportunity to come in, invade our space, and destroy our relationships. Don't even crack the door open because if you do, he's coming in. So here's what I want to do. I want to just play a little game with you and I want you to tell me what you think regarding these things as far as immoral or impure. Would you say if you lie to your spouse, you go hook up with another man or another woman, rent a hotel room and go have wild raging sex, would you say that's impure or immoral? Would you say yes? Yeah. How about this? Would you just say looking at porn once or twice a week on your phone, would you say that's a hint of immorality? Just a, just a hint? What, what about something like this? What about just occasionally inappropriate, maybe not even inappropriate, but conversations behind the scenes in an inbox with somebody that you're not married to? Would you say that's a hint? What about watching Netflix, and they're not really showing anything, but there's some stuff going on under the covers, there's, there's some language going on. Would you say that's a hint? Let me tell you what God's doing in my life right now um, with Linda. I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, Linda and I, there are several shows that we watch on Netflix. 
really like some of these shows. But I, I have to tell you, recently, it's been really tough for us, and we've decided because the spirit of the living God has been kind of convicting me that this is more than a hint, what I'm seeing. And it's just not sitting right with me. And I start to get uncomfortable watching some of this stuff. So it's been forcing us, by choice, to go, I'm not going to watch this anymore. And we're some of the most unlegalistic people that you'll meet. But there's just something, when I read this scripture, that I go, this isn't sitting right with me. This is more, this is more than a hint. What, what about this? What about you taking a selfie of yourself girls from this angle and then going like hashtag blessed <laughs> yeah. come on blessed would you say that's a hit I would say that's a hit I would say that's, that's more than a hint so what does God say God says not a hint so what I'm telling you is watch when you slam the door on temptation it's like kicking the devil in the teeth and I want to be a church that slams the door and kicks the devil in the teeth. So what I'm saying is, not a hint. Like, like not a hint. I'm going to have, uh, bring some stuff out here. And I want you, as, as they bring this out, I want you to listen to this scripture. Check this out. Proverbs 4, 14 and 15. Watch what it says. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. What's it say? You all reading it? Avoid it. Do you have that? Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it. And what? Go on your way. Avoid it. Don't even go near it. Go on, on your way. So here's what I want to do. I want you to think about this. In life, there are environments that God has created and destined to be one of two things. There is an environment that I call the sin zone. There is an environment that I call the safe zone. And there is a line that separates the two. And I want you to think in these terms. This might help you. In the sin zone, let's just say it's filled with deadly poisonous snakes. Ooh. Think about that. All, all these snakes. And if you go into the sin zone you're going to get bit, and it's going to kill you. So that, that's the sin zone. Over here in the safe zone, man, it's like when God said, hey, this is the Garden of Eden. You can do anything you want, except one thing. Just don't go near the tree. Like, don't cross the line. But what we do, so many of us, we just kind of see how close we can get to the sin zone just testing the water because we forget that it's deadly. But see, the Bible says the wage of sin is death. But what we do, well, I'll just, I'll just test the water. And here's what many of us do. Check this out because I've been there and you've been there. What do we do? We start to move the line. How close can I get? I'm still not there. I can get a little closer. It's deadly. It's a deadly space. And what I'm suggesting, don't miss this. What I'm about to tell you is I'm not going to tell you don't cross the line. I'm going to tell you don't go near the line. I'm going to say don't even go close to the line. Come on, run from the line. Don't go near the line, man. I tell people all the time, I say, if you put yourself in a position to fail, don't be surprised when you do. The sin zone. So what does that mean? What do we do? Well, let me give you, let me give you some examples. Check this out. Let's just say that there's a person that you're getting emotionally connected to at work. Um, just kind of emotionally connecting. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to tell your boss, would you transfer me to another department? Because I'm not going to go near the line. I, I need to be moved. Would you move my desk? Would you move me to a different department? Here's another thing. You struggle with gambling. 
and that's, that's an issue for you. And what you do is you stop at these places and you put money in these machines. So what I'm saying is here's not going near the line. If you go pa past one of these places on your way home from work, you're going to start to take a different route home. And that's you saying, I'm not going to go near the line. You're going to change the route, even if it takes you longer to get home, so that you don't go near the line. For some of you, it's, it just depends on what it is. If it's alcohol and you struggle with alcohol and you're like, hey, my friends want to take me out for dinner and they ser serve booze at the, at the restaurant, what I'm saying is you have a choice. You're either going to say, we're going to go to a different restaurant or I'm not going to go because I'm not going to get near the line. Because if I get near the line, it's deadly and it's dangerous and I'm putting myself in a position to fail and I'm not going to do that. Come on, not even a hint of immorality. I'm, I'm going to avoid it at all costs. Now, some, sometimes, look, you might say, oh, Tim, this is crazy. I mean, this, this seems like a lot, doesn't it? Ask yourself this, this question. Why in the world would you choose to fight a temptation tomorrow if you had the power to eliminate it today? That's good preaching. When you can shut it down right now, why would you even dabble in it? Because if you do... Man, you're going down. There is an enemy that wants to destroy your relationships. Don't even dabble in it. Now, as I do this, listen, there are probably two types of groups right now in our church as I've been preaching on this. And here, here's my thought. There is probably one camp, and you're like, let's say this is the safe zone. You're like way over here, and you're like, okay, pastor, normally I, I agree with you. And I'm, I'm like for some of the stuff you're saying, but today this seems like a little far. This seems like a little much, like uh, has to be transferred at work. That, that seems like a lot, like take a different route home. Just uh, this seems like it's, you've gone a little, a little over. That, that's one camp. Now here's the other camp. People that are so far over here that you've already crossed the line and you've messed your life up and you're wondering if you can ever recover from the mistakes that you made. So this is where we're at. All of us are in one of these two places. So let, let me give you a scripture that's found in 1 Corinthians. And it's something that Paul said, and he talks to both of these groups, no matter where you are today. Check this out. He says this, and I want to talk to the people that does, they don't see this as a problem. Like, I'm not, I'm not worried. Like, I'm going to be fine. It's not a big deal. Check out what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, starting at verse 12. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall because no, tempta no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. What's he saying? If you think that it's not a problem, oh, it's a problem. If you think that you're not gonna fall, guess what? Pride comes before the fall. If you think, man, I'm exempt from this, this doesn't apply to me, what's he saying? Oh, it sure does. And you better be ready because when you least expect it, the enemy's coming. Oh, my, my marriage is perfect. My family is perfect. What's he saying? You better be careful. You better stay alert. Is what he's saying. Now watch on the other side of this. Here's the good news. Watch for those of us that have crossed the line. Are you ready? Check it out. Our God is faithful. Isn't that good news? Our God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. When you are tempted, our great God who is faithful will not let you stay there. He's going to give you a way out. All you have to do is avoid the line. Come on, don't go near the line. That's your way out. Don't go near the line. Don't get close to it. Don't think about it. Don't concentrate on it. Don't go near the line. That's some great, that's some great news today. Now, I just wanted to say this quickly because some of you are here today and you're not married and you're like, man, this was easy for me today. This wasn't about me. I'm, I'm off the hook today on this, this marriage thing. Oh, no, you're not. <laughs> it does apply. Check it out. If you're here today and you're not married, I want to remind you, the choices you make today will create the reality, reality that you live in tomorrow. It starts now. Listen, you don't build a righteous life for your future on a foundation of sin today. Oh, come on, somebody. That's good preaching. You don't, you don't build a righteous life for your future Building on a foundation of sin, what do you do? You start right now. 
and you start doing the right things right now. And if you're here today and you're single and maybe you're thinking about, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about dating. Pastor, I have one question. If, you, if I could ask you one question, what do you think would be the most important thing that you could tell me if I'm single and thinking about dating? And I thought about this, and here's my advice. You ready? Don't date a project. If you need someone to fix, spend that time working on yourself. Don't you dare date a project. Because if someone requires you to be dysfunctional and not be yourself, listen, that's not loving you, that's manipulating you and exploiting you. Don't do it. And if you're dating someone, and, and again, I'm just, sometimes confrontation uh, is important. And if you're dating someone that's not a Christian and you are, here's what I would tell you. Don't wait one more minute, end it right now. You don't want to date a project. And this is too important. Christianity isn't something that you do, it's who you are. And how can you be combined, be joined with someone that is not as you are? Because light and dark, they don't mix. You, you need to think about this. I know this is tough, and some of you are like, I'm too far in, or man, I don't want to be alone. Are you really that desperate to think that a great God does not have a plan and a purpose for your life? It can bring you the right person when the time is right? Come on, God works all things out for good. Don't you ever get that desperate to think, if I don't settle for this, I'm never going to have anything. That's a lie from the enemy. Don't you settle. Like, run. That, that, would, be, that would be my advice. Listen, I'm not saying this to hurt anyone. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to save you pain. Come on, it's a distraction. And I, I just want to talk personally about me for one minute. I want you to hear this. Whenever I'm tempted to do anything wrong, anything that could hurt my family, anything that could hurt my life, anything that could hurt my church, here's what I do, watch. I try to visualize and fast forward what this action will cost me. That's what I try to do. Like I, I try to pause and I try to see in the future and see what this is really gonna, gonna do to me. And let me give you an example. If I were to fall, if I, if I were to miss the mark to temptation, let me tell you what it'd do, number one. It would probably cost me this church that I prayed and begged God to entrust me with for so many years. And it might not, everybody might not leave, but, but I would tell you, the, the trust that I've tried to build with you over the last 10 years would be gone just like that. Just like that. It would cost me. Let me tell you, even more importantly, the three daughters that I have that not only call me pastor, more importantly, they call me dad, I'd lose their trust and I'd break their heart. And that's important. And I, I, wanna, I visualize that. And listen, it's not that God wouldn't forgive me. God would forgive me. But your choices will cost you every time. There are consequences to the choices we make. And let me tell you the, the, the most important thing. Here's what I visualize. My wife that stood by me for the last 30 years, that has been my rock, that has not left my side, it would crush her. The wife of me for 30, the daughter or the mother of my three kids, it would break her heart. So what do I do? I visualize it. I want you to feel this today. I want you to internalize this. I want you to think about it. When you're tempted, the Bible says, I'm not going to give you, like, or the Bible says, I'm going to give you a way out of this thing. God's going to give you a way out. And here's, here's one of your way outs. Don't go near the line and fast forward in your thoughts and see what this could actually do. Ask yourself this question. I have two questions for you. Check it out because the enemy's coming for your relationships. Watch. If you're married here today, engaged, whatever that looks like, in our marriage, ask yourself this, where are we most vulnerable in spiritual attacks? Ask yourself that. You need to talk about that with your spouse. That, that's something that you need to discuss. And if you're single, check it out. Ask yourself this, where am I most vulnerable in spiritual attacks? Where am I most vulnerable? Because listen, 
you're only as strong as you are honest. So, like, just be honest with yourself. You're only as strong as you are honest. So I, I want to close with this today. I, I want to talk to, to the girls for just one minute. And I, I want to talk to maybe you're here, and uh, there's a little pushback um, on this today. And you're, because you're, uh, maybe your, your spouse, your husband, um, they're just not there yet. And like you, you feel like you're far ahead of the game spiritually, and maybe they're not even coming to church with you. Um, they're not into the, the things that you're into. And like you, you're trying to move your family ahead and your, fa- your husband's trying to like hold it back and you're excited about church and you're excited about the things of God and like you, you're, you're running and your husband's not there. And here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. Check this out. I'm gonna ask you all of the time that you would have spent like nagging him and complaining about him on the things that he's not doing I'm going to ask you to take all of that time and instead start praying for him. Start praying for him. And here's what I want you to do. Every time that you see him take a step forward, I want you to celebrate it. Every time that he does something right, every time that he, he, he says something that's encouraging and you, you see there's a spark there, you know what you're going to do? You're going to feed into that. And, and you're going you're gonna to celebrate him. And you're going to thank him. And, and you're going to be for him. Because listen, your spouse is not the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. Now to the men. I'm not going to be so nice to you. <laughs> If you are a man and you are a Christian, what I'm going to tell you is this. You need to get up off your lazy butt and start being the man that God has called you to be and start leading your family. You don't need to mess around anymore. You need to be the man of the family. God has given you that role. What are you waiting on? What, what are you being passive about? You need to be the man of the house. You need to be the one that's saying, hey, it's the weekend. Family, we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to think about it. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Get in the car. Come on, we're going to church. You be the man. Be the one that stands up for the things of God. Come on, you've come too far to let this fail. Defend your house. Defend your spouse. Say that I'm going to lead. Come on, stand up for the things that you love. Don't let them fail. It just matters too much. It, it, too much is at stake. Too much, listen, too much is at stake. So if you're sitting right now, would you do me a favor? Would you stand? Would you, would you just stand? I want, I want the whole church to stand for this. And I want you to receive what I'm about to tell you. And if you're here, would you just uh, take a minute and would you close your eyes and would you bow your heads?